Hey, what's up guys? My name is Acherno. Welcome to another video. So, I'm on the couch this time. After a long day of work, thought I'd mix it up. Let's talk about variables in C++. So, when we write a program in C++, we want to be able to use data. Most of what programming is about is actually using data. We manipulate data. That's what we do. So any kind of data that we use in our program that we want to change, that we want to modify, that we want to read and write from, we need to store this data in something called a variable. So variables basically allow us to name a piece of data that we store in memory so that we can keep using it. As an example, pretend that you're making a game and you've got a player in your game and that player character has some kind of position on the map and the player character can move. So we need to be able to store the player's position as some kind of variable in our memory so that when it comes time to draw the player on the screen or interact with the rest of the level, we can actually see, hey, where on earth is the player? So we would want to store the player's position in a variable. This is basically one of the fundamentals of writing a program in any language. We need to be able to play with data and store that data somewhere. When we create a variable, it's going to be stored in memory in one of two places, the stack or the heap. Don't worry, we're gonna have a lot of videos discussing how memory actually works. So if you're looking for a more, more of an in-depth kind of explanation, that'll definitely come. But for now, just know that variables do occupy memory. That's where we actually store the data, in our computer's memory. In C++, we're given a bunch of primitive data types. These primitive data types essentially form the building blocks of any kind of data we store in our program. Each data type that C++ gives us has a specific purpose. Whilst it has a specific purpose, you don't actually have to use it for that purpose. It's interesting because C++ is a very powerful language, which means there are actually very few rules when you actually get down to it. So when I explain variables, I like to say that really the only distinction between the different variable types you have in C++ is the size. How much memory does this variable occupy? When it comes down to it, that's really the only difference between these primitive data types. How big are they? Let's go ahead and jump into Visual Studio and take a look at some examples. So we've actually already got a variable type that we're using here, int. Int stands for integer, and it lets us store an integer in a given range. If we want to declare a brand new variable, we can do so by typing the type of the variable, giving it some kind of name, for example, variable, and then giving it a value. Now this last part is optional. You don't have to give it a value immediately, but for now, let's just give it the value eight. An integer is a data type that is traditionally four bytes large. The actual size of a data type depends on the compiler. So it may be different depending on what compiler you're using. Ultimately, it's the compiler's choice to tell you how big a data type's gonna be. The int data type is meant for storing integers in a certain range. Because it's four bytes large, we are limited as to what kind of numbers we can store with it. Specifically, this is something called a signed integer that can store a value of around negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. Anything larger or smaller than that is going to require more data to store than this int actually supports. So with four bytes of data, we can store a value between this range. So let's go ahead and try and print out our variable to the console to see what it actually is. I'll substitute this hello world with this actual variable. This is how we can log a variable to the console. Let's hit F5 to run our program, and you can see it prints out the number eight. Awesome. We can go ahead and modify our variable, for example, by reassigning it to something else, like 20. Let's go ahead and print it again and see what happens. So we're printing it once here, and then again here. So we should get the value eight printing first, and then the value 20. And you can see if we run our program, that's exactly what we get. Cool. So as I said, an int data type can store a value between negative two billion and positive two billion. So you might be like, why is it negative 2 billion and positive 2 billion? It's not exactly 2 billion, by the way. It's like 2 point something billion. Where are these limits coming from? Do they make any sense? And the answer is yes, they make sense. They are directly tied with the size of the variable. That is how much data we're allowed to store in it. An integer is four bytes. With four bytes of data, we can store values in that range. Let's break this down a little bit. So one byte is eight bits of data, which means that four bytes is 32 bits of data. Because this variable is signed, meaning it can be negative, it contains a sign, like a negative sign. Because this variable is signed, one of those bits, one of those 32 bits has to be for the sign so that we know if it's positive or negative, which only leaves 31 bits left for the actual number. Now a bit can either be zero or one, so there are two possible values for one bit of data. So using a little bit of maths here, 
we can say that we have 31 bits to play with, two possible values per bit. So what is two to the power of 31? If we crack open a calculator here and type in two to the power of 31, we will get about 2 billion. That value there, that 2.1 billion, that is the maximum number that we can store with an integer. Now remember, we also have one bit that is reserved for whether or not that number is negative. So because of that, we can store up to that number from zero, but also we can go the other way and store all the negative values down to negative 2.1 billion. But I don't want negative values, I hear you say. Is there a way to just get rid of that one bit being for the negative sign and just use it as part of my number? Why, yes, yes, there is. That is what we call an unsigned number. That means it's a number that does not have a sign, meaning it's always positive. In C++, we can make one of those by just typing in unsigned in front of our integer. So now what we've done is we have 32 bits to play with. And two to the power of 32, of course, is double what we have here, 4.29 billion. And that's basically what the unsigned keyword does in C++. It lets us define an integer that does not have a sign bit. Okay, so what other data types do we have available to us? What if I don't want a four byte integer? What other types are there? So as far as integer values goes, we actually have quite a few. We've got char, which is one byte of data. We've got short, which is two bytes of data. We have int, which is four bytes of data. We have long, which is also usually four bytes of data, depending on the compiler. And then we have long long, which is usually eight bytes of data. There's also other types like long int. There are a few different modifications here. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but the basic ones are these five. You can also add unsigned to any of these and it will remove that sign bit and let you set a larger number. Char traditionally is also used for storing characters, not just numbers. So apart from assigning numbers to it, like 50, you can also assign characters to it like A. Now that's not to say you can't assign characters to other integers, you can. Because at the end of the day, this character that I typed, this letter A, it's just a number. In fact, that number, that numeric value associated with that character, the character A, is 65. Now, if numbers are just characters and if characters are just numbers, then why exactly do we have this distinction? Why do I say that char is specifically used for characters, whereas it's really not? That is because we often, as programmers, make assumptions about certain data types. If I pass in a char and call it something like character, I usually expect you to actually assign a character to it. So a good example of this is if you actually try and print out a char. If I print out this variable, a for example, and I hit a five, I'm not going to get the number associated with it. I'm going to get the character A printed out. So if I replace this with its actual numeric value like 65, I'm also gonna get the value A printed out as you can see over here. Because C out, if I pass in a char into C out, it's going to treat it like a character, not like a number. If I change it to be some other type, like a short for example, and hit F5, you can see that C out no longer treats it like a character, it's going to actually print out the numeric value. And even if I assign a character here, it's just really assigning the value 65. So if I run this again, you can see that we get 65. So the reason I'm telling you all this is because I want you to understand that data types the usage of data types is just up to the programmer, really. There are certain conventions that we have in place, but there's nothing concrete that you have to actually follow. There are very little rules in C++ after all. So because of that, I do want you to realize that the only real difference between these data types is how much memory will be allocated when you create a variable with that data type. So with those integer types aside, what if I want to store a decimal value? For example, 5.5, how do I do that? Well, for that, we have two data types. We have float and we have double. There are also some modifiers that you can do like long double, we're not gonna get into those. So a float is basically a decimal value that we can store that occupies four bytes of data. So let's define a variable here such as 5.5. How do we do that? Let's also replace this variable A with printing out our float variable and compile our file. Let's hit F5 to run our program and you can see we get 5.5 printed out, fantastic. Now you may think that you've defined a float here but you actually haven't. You've actually defined a double. If we go back to Visual Studio and we hover our mouse over this value, you can see that in brackets it says double. As I just mentioned, we have two different variables that we can use to store decimal numbers, float and double. So how do we discern between what a double is and what a float is? The way we do that is by basically appending an F to our float variables. It can be lowercase or uppercase, it doesn't matter. But the point is, if we have an F, you can see that we've actually declared a float. So floats are basically four bytes large and doubles are eight bytes large. Finally, we have one more 
primitive data type to play with, and that is bool. Now, bool stands for boolean, and it can either be true or false. If we try and print it to our console and hit F5, you can see that we'll actually get a numeric value, one. Because of course, there's no such thing as true or false. Those are English words. Computers deal with numbers. So basically zero means false and anything except zero, any other number means true. In this case, we'll actually get one printing to the console indicating that it is true. If we change this to false and run our program, we will get zero, which means false. The bool data type occupies one byte of memory. Now you might be wondering one byte, why? A bool can either be true or false. Surely that only takes one bit to represent. And you are correct. It does take one bit to represent. However, when we're dealing with addressing memory, that is we need to retrieve our bool from memory or store it in memory, there is no way for us to actually address individual bits. We can only address bytes. So because of that, we can't actually create a variable type that is one bit because we need to be able to access it and we can't, we can only access bytes. Now, of course, one thing you could do on the other hand is be really smart about how you store data and store eight bools in one byte. That's totally okay. One bit per bool, but you still have that one byte of allocated memory. We'll probably talk about advanced fun tricks like that in the future, but for now, a bool is one byte of memory. So with all this talk of sizes and bytes and how much everything takes, how how do we actually know how big a data type is? It is dependent on the compiler after all. Is there some way we can check? Yes, yes there is. There's an operator we have available to us in C++ called size of. So if we come over here and we print size of bool, for example, we basically just type in the word size of and then either in brackets or not doesn't really matter. Although I do prefer to use brackets or parentheses, I should say. We type in our data type, hit F5. You can see it tells us that a bool is one byte. If I replace this with int and hit F5, we have four. And if I do something like double and hit F5, we have eight. Awesome, pretty cool stuff. So that's basically all there is to variables, or at least the primitive types that I've covered. There are many different types that you can actually create in C++ and that have already been created for you. However, they're all custom types that are all based on these primitive types. These are the building blocks that we use to define and store any kind of data we could possibly create. Now with any of these primitive data types, we also have the ability to turn them into pointers or references. Pointers can be declared by writing an asterisk next to your type like this and references by an ampersand next to your type. Pointers and references are such huge and complicated and vital topics that I really wanna save them for separate videos so that you guys understand them properly. So for now, for this video, we're just gonna stick with these primitive types. Make sure you understand them they're going to be the basis for pretty much everything you ever write. So they're really important. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And if you really like this video and you wanna be a part of how future videos get made, you wanna to contribute to the planning of these videos as well as receive early drafts of videos as I'm making them, then please support me on Patreon. The link will be in the description of this video. Your support there is what makes these videos possible. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.